First, very importantly, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for coming out tonight. I totally understand, <clears throat> is this better? I totally understand how difficult it is sometimes to come out in the evenings, especially at bedtime. Um, so I really greatly appreciate um, everybody coming out tonight. For those who uh, I have not had the dear pleasure of meeting, my name is Yaakov Lazar. My wife and I are co-founders and directors of Kol HaNeshamot. Kol HaNeshamot was be began and started. We saw a need in a community where, unfortunately, many children um, have gone in a different derech of their parents, of their families, their friends. And the pain of the parents was so deep and they had nowhere to turn to, and they felt ostracized, they felt alone. We're here, hopefully, to help fill that void. For those who haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, we've been discussing attunement, how to attune into our, attune into our children. We discussed when if sometimes that may not work and kids fall on the side, they may turn to a, something called addiction. And if we miss that and we don't understand what is really going on, unfortunately, Rahman al we have cases where children think about it and turn to suicide. Tonight is not that um, deep, per se. But Bezrat Hashem will have a little bit more chizuk, a little more understanding. This topic is not a topic that hasn't been discussed for thousands of years. As a matter of fact, yesterday we read in Pasha's Bahar. Uh, let's see if I can find the exact pasuk over here. Okay. When it was talking about selling property, selling your items. First it says, Altonu ish es ochiv. Very straightforward. Don't make mistakes. And as Rashi and Mufarshim explain, when it comes to purchase, do not tell your friend, make a mistake with purchase price. A couple of Pesukim later, it says again, Belosonu ish es amiso you want to repeat it to show how important it is? That's fine. You could have just said, Kiani Hashem. You know, don't make mistakes. Don't cause somebody to pay the wrong price. But as the Mepharshim explained, the Chazal explained, the second one is with your words. The first one is about Memkar, you know, uh, Purchasing. The second one is your words. Don't give bad eights out. Don't give. Don't tell somebody the wrong thing. So could have just also stopped Kiani Hashem. Like many times, our Kaddish Baruch Hu says something, and it's very important. I'm God, and I'm telling you this is the way it should be. But he says Hello Kehem. We can look at it in a different way. It says Hakadosh Baruch Hu is telling us. I am a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and I understand what's going on in somebody else's head. I understand what's going else in somebody else's heart. Be careful what you say to somebody when you see somebody doing something wrong. Don't blast them and lambast them or, or tell them all these different things if you don't know what they've been going through. Walk a mile in their shoes and understand what they're going through. I understand. I'm a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and I know what's going on in their hearts. And I know what's going on in their minds. So until you have that relationship, where in other times it says, it's all about the how HaKadosh Baruch Hu has that beautiful and wonderful relationship with us. Just like that, we need to have that relationship with others, whether it's your friend, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your children. You need to have that relationship with them to understand what they're going through in order to 
give them advice. Baruch Hashem, in our neighborhood, we have many gedolim, and one very special gadol here, who Baruch Hashem makes it his, his business to understand and know who he's talking to, and be able to give the advice that is proper for each and every one of the person that he deals with. I'd like to introduce a Rav Gorn, a Rav Elimelech Kornfeld Shlita. Shakoyach to Rav Yaakov Lazar and his wife for putting this together in the past few weeks together. This is something very important for all of us, and we appreciate it tremendously. Also, especially Yashakoyo to Rav Shimon Russell with his tremendously busy schedule to make time for us over here. And I'm sure we're going to hear tremendous things from him. And Shakoyach to the parents that have come out of the understanding how important these issues are. And the more we appreciate them, the more siyad shmai we will have in getting through every situation in the proper fashion. Just want to say one short thing in the vein of what Rabbi Yaakov said now. There's an amazing posik right before Matan Torah. We're getting closer to Matan Torah. It says that Hashem had in front of him in front of him, Kelivna Sapir, a famous Rashi that brings that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had a brick made out of sapphire in front of him. What is this brick all about? So we know the Rashi. The Rashi says the brick is all about that when Kalei Yisrael was in Shibud Mitzrayim, we were building bricks the whole day, Hashem Kaviyochel wanted to have a picture in front of his eyes to feel the Tsar of Kalei Yisrael, to be noise ba'oil with the Tsar that Kalei Yisrael was going through. And then when Kalei was freed, the beautiful blue skies of the freedom of Kalei Yisrael. The Mashgir Volba points out a beautiful thing. It's an, as it is, the Rashi is a beautiful idea that Hashem really cares about us and is living with our pain and with our happiness constantly on a constant basis. But why is this exactly right before Matan Torah, before the giving of the Torah? And he says that this is what it's all about. The whole Torah that was given to us by Kodesh Bohu is because that Kodesh Bohu wants to have a deep relationship with us. He wants to interact with us. He wants to be nice and be all with us. And that's what Torah is all about. He gave us this opportunity through the Torah that we could connect to him in a greater way and have the eternal goodness in this world and the world to come. I heard once from Rav Rav Moshe Hillel Hirsch, he should be healthy. Shame of Ban Kotler. An interesting thing. He was talking about a spouse. And he said in a very yeshivish term, if you don't understand it, come back to me afterwards and I'll explain it. But I'm sure, I think you will understand it. He said like this. He was talking about a husband to a wife. But it's the same thing, wife to husband and parents to a child. He said, you should know you're getting married. Your wife is a sugya, and it takes the entire life to learn that sugya. In other words, life and relationships is about not just assuming that everything that I like and, and I appreciate, and some they also like and appreciate, and what I dislike, they dislike. But it's learning them up, understanding them, seeing from their reactions what makes them happy, what makes them good, and what disturbs them. And by doing so, we could build that loving relationship. And, the, and, the, and like we said, the shoyrish, the source of all this is HaKadosh Bohu himself. HaKadosh Bohu, not expecting from us to be on his madrega, but living with us, understanding our shortcomings. Someone's told me about a certain person, I have no hope for him. And I said, I don't understand. If he's still alive, that means Hashem does have hope for him. Hashem doesn't keep a person alive for no reason. And if Hashem has hope for him, then we sure should have hope for him. I just want to be mevorach, the entire tzibur, we're getting together. It's, it's a double of getting together for the benefit of our families, it brings tremendous nachas ruach to Kodesh Bohu. It should bring tremendous siyad to everybody, to all the parents and to the children. And together we should grow together with this, like we're saying, Nesiyas Ba'olim Chaveru, feeling the other person, learning them up. And together with that, with our tefillahs and our maizim toivim, Yet Hashem, we should and all of you should be saying to see tremendous nachas ruach from all your children. For the last number of years, my wife and I have been zocha to know Rav Shimon Russell and his wife, Rav Tzin Yocheved, 
who have not only helped us in our journey, but to help us understand how to help others on their journey. There are no words that I can say to do a proper introduction. So I'm just going to do so. Please welcome Herb Shimon Russell. Okay, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for schlepping out on a Sunday night. I've been doing this for many, many years. And, um, you know, as many times as we do it, we see the problem seems to be growing, not diminishing. But what's comforting is that this kind of evening, 25 years ago, maybe 10, 15 people showed up. What's comforting is that we, as Klali Sol, are recognizing we need help. We need something different. We need to understand what's going on differently so that we can truly help our children. A few years ago, I, um, I put together some statistics that I found quite shocking. Verified statistics of suicides and drug overdoses in the Frum community. The last statistics I had was in 2021. It was based on four states in America, four states, New York, New Jersey, Florida, and California, just those four states. It looked at the group between 16 and 30 years old, males and females. And in 2021, in those four states alone, there were documented 263 suicides and ODs from, from kids, from young people. If you extend, it doesn't take much math to work out that more than one a day are dying. I took this information to Gadol Yisrael, and I asked them a simple psak. Does this sugya now become a sugya of Sophic Pekuch Nefesh? Yes or no? And they said yes. It makes a huge nafkamina to us in our work and how we understand and how we have to relate to it. That doesn't mean that every single child who's struggling is in a Sophic Pekuch Nefesh. But I know this, that if we approach this sugya, if we try to understand what's really going on inside the kids, the trickle-down impact on all the other children who perhaps, thank God, would not bring themselves to such a severe and permanent end, but we can help them live and live their lives in a better, more productive way, a healthier way. We can help our families and help these children. For me, the opening of this sugya, for all of us, has to be compassion. We have to change our hearts, release ourselves and free ourselves, so we let go of when we look at our struggling children, we can with confidence, let go of thinking that the traditional models of chinuch that we grew up with, if I can just say it bluntly, the world of tzvei pech, two wax that we grew up with, that world does not apply. And we need a different sugya. And I want to explain why what that sugya is, so that we know what to do. It starts with compassion, the deepest compassion that should bring us to a broken heart. When we look at our children who are struggling and not leave any room for critique, for criticizing them, for blaming them, for wondering why are they doing this, why can't they make better decisions, What's wrong with them? As if it's a taina what's wrong with them. Instead of what we really need in our hearts, is what's wrong with them? Can I understand what's wrong? What's hurting? 
What's going on inside them? The Assad, the foundation for saving the life of any of these children, comes from our compassion. And trust me, they know. They know if it's coming from your compassionate heart or it's coming just because you don't know else what to do. So you're following some sort of script. You're, you're trying to say the right words, but it's coming from here. It's not coming from here. I've captured it like this. This is the best way I can say it. Each time I say over, you know, the, you know forgive me, those who've heard me before, I'm like a broken record. I apologize. But I'm reassured by my wife, Zalzain Gesund, who sat through every one of my drashas, Nebuch, and she tells me when I get home, it was amazing. It, was, it went in deeper this time. I, 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 you know, before it was up, it was up here, it's, it's, it's going down here. Many, many people have told me they've come to listen to me tens of times on the exact same drasha. And they tell me each time it just goes that little bit deeper for the gentleman, aim base medrash below chidush. There's always something new. There's always, there, for myself, there's always a clarity. I evolve. And with me evolves the clarity of the pain and what we need to do to help these children. I hope after I'm gone, someone will say, Omer Reb Shimon, Al Shnei Amudim, Oilam Hayiladim, our children, Oymed. On two pillars, the lives of our children stand. I hope someone will say it over. Uhaya Oymed. What are these two pillars? And it's crucial to get this and to drink this in and painfully live this. When I first started talking about these inyanim, I talked about sexual abuse. That's one of the uh, amudim. I talked about it years ago, and people begged me not to say that word in public. Please don't say that word. Everyone's uncomfortable. I observed to them that our discomfort with talking about it, causes abuse. And until we rein in our discomfort, hold our discomfort, find a place in your heart to hold that discomfort while we go into a very deep place of understanding our children's trauma and hurt. One of the Amudim, let me tell you them both, the two amudim, our children's lives, depend upon. Their very lives depend upon it. Uh, one amud I call hatsnei aleches, to walk humbly with Hashem. The other is limud Torah, is learning Torah. These two amudim support, ideally, our children's lives throughout their whole development up and until they get married. Hatsnei aleches, what does this mean? So, of course, it includes the obvious things of clothing, of covering one's body, of being tsanur. It includes shemir senayim and shemir saguf for men. It includes walking modestly with Hashem. It means walking as a humble person before Hashem. If you're wealthy enough to endow a big building that you don't put your name in gigantic 20-foot-high red flashing neon lights with arrows pointing it on top of the building. That's not Hatsnei Alechas. You put it discreetly on the side, hopefully to encourage other people of means to endow buildings. Hatsnei Alechas covers a lot of things. But for our children, more the girls than the boys, although for the boys too when they hit high school, it's a main icker of their life. It's not something that they do. It's not like shaking a lulav or putting on tefillin. 
It's the essence of who you are. I hope you understand this. We try to inculcate, to draw this into their metzius, their being, as the essence of their life. Ideally, a child goes through life, let's take a girl, would go through life in a bubble, this, a wonderful bubble of Hatsnei Alechas, where she goes through life understanding how to be Tzanua and live as a Tzanua and dress as a Tzanua and act as a Tzanua. This is the ideal. For us in our world, there's no room in that bubble for sexuality. It doesn't belong there until you get married. And then, the ideal of everything we believe in occurs both for the boy and girl, ideally, and I must tell you, I've seen it once or twice in my career where it actually happened. And a child became a chassan or kala and were just not aware very much of sexuality at all, what it means, the role it plays in our lives. There are just one or two kids left like that. There are. I've met some. Most amazing ideal of everything about our system. And so after their chosen and kala, we introduce, follow the logic, we introduce into this pre-existing bubble called Hatsnei Alechas, the sugya of sexuality is included and becomes an expanded form of Hatsnei Alechas. It's not something different. It's not separate to. On the contrary, in the ideal of everything in our values, we should integrate seamlessly the sugya of sexuality beautifully and sensitively expanding the sugya of Hatsnei Aleches to include it and incorporate it and therefore it's something we support and we're proud of. What happens? This is both to boys and girls in our world when they become sexually abused. And I can t tell you that when I myself did the research some 20 years ago, I was shocked to discover that in the sugya of struggling kids, that eight out of 10 reported sexual abuse. And that seemed to be the reason they'd gone off. And I worked on it for years. Later on, other agencies, true agencies, it wasn't just me on my own, did the research and came up with the same figures. How does this destroy the life? What does this do? So I want to just give you a marshal, a very painful marshal to understand this. Imagine a young girl goes to, let's take a, she goes to seminary after high school. She comes home. Her parents get her help her get a job, and then she starts shidduchim. And she gets a good shidduch one that she likes, that's good for her, good for the family, and everyone's exceedingly joyful. Exceedingly joyful. The chasna is scheduled five months later. And five months later, they talk, I have a beautiful chasna. Three months after the chasna, this young girl, just turned 20, comes to her mother a little shy, a little embarrassed, a little tiny bit awkward to announce that she's pregnant. Anyone who's experienced this moment knows how unbelievably joyful that moment is. Everyone cries. Everyone cries. It's just incredibly joyful. It's like, it's almost more joyful than the chasna. 
There's something about the moment to know your daughter can have a baby and she's able to be pregnant and she'll bring a grandchild in this world. There's something spectacular about that moment. Nobody turns around to her and says, what? What do you mean? How'd you get pregnant? Like, I, I don't understand. How could, of course not. We just all embrace that moment and understand what's happened. And it's something we support as one of the highest values we have. Imagine, we all know this. One of the highest values we have as Klalisol is that we have a child. We bring a child into this world. And it's something we cry joyfully at that moment. I think everyone would agree. Okay, let's play this story again. Same girl comes back after seminary. They get her a job. And uh, they start shidduchim, and she finds a shidduch perfect for her, perfect, they think, for the family. It just seems perfect. And they schedule the chasna five months later. Three months before the chasna, this girl comes to her mother and tells her mother, Mommy, I think I'm pregnant. The only nafgamina in the entire story is one is three months after that date, and one is three months before that date. And three months before, Pischa de Gehinnom opens up under the parents' feet. They want to die. Because there's no mockum, there's no place, there's no way on earth that experience can be supported, embraced, let alone loved and rejoiced about. It's a moment of such profound pain and hurt because there is no mockum in the Torah world for sexual activity prior to marriage. There is no such thing. It can never be supported. It can never be helped and enjoyed and appreciated and valued. Adaraba, it's Gehinnom. So let's understand the life of a child who is sexually abused. See, that child also goes to school. And at school and at home, they listen to the voice of their parents and their teachers, the strong voice pushing and encouraging and directing them to be tsanua, to dress tsanua, to act tsanua. We push them. We strongly encourage them. We make it a huge issue. And in school, we all know if they don't follow that in school, they're out. So we become desperate. And yet a child who's been abused, they already have another bubble they're floating around the world in. And that's the bubble of being aware of themselves sexually. And that bubble has no connection to Hatznei Alechas. It doesn't fit. It doesn't belong. It doesn't connect. It contradicts. And the internal world of that child is shattered. Imagine the world of a sexual abuse victim who has a very simple choice. I can completely shut it down, shut myself down, shut off part of who I am. Just shut it down. And what a price most of them pay when they get married and discover they've shut it down completely and look at it as something abhorrent and disgusting. What a price they pay for the rest of their lives till that gets treated, if at all. How many young divorces quickly after the marriage come from such young people who shut it down completely only to have to face it when they got married and never told anyone, never spoke about it. Many times, I can tell you, in my office, 
Many times they suppressed it so much they didn't remember. They don't remember the details themselves till it starts floating up after they get married. That's one choice. Shut it down and pay the price for that. Dissociate, disconnect. How many kids I know who've gone through school dissociating their entire way through school because everything and anything that ever sounds like sexual abuse ever, excuse me, anything or anything that ever sounds like Hatznei Leches triggers them. What happens to these poor kids when they discover themselves as sexual beings pre-marriage? What are they meant to do with that? You can't put the genie back in the bottle. You can't turn it off once it's been discovered. That's some, it's a koyach, you can't just say it, it doesn't exist once it, it does exist. And every single day that they hear anything, anything said to them, taught to them, instructed to them about sneers, about shmir senayim or shmir aguf, when many of them go the opposite direction where they are now fully active with themselves sexually, living in a world, school, and environment, and home, where they know that if you would know how I'm behaving, you'd reject me. You would reject me. And Haraya, they discover it's true, because kids get caught and get rejected. They get thrown out. So they live in a world where these two bubbles, they don't meet, they don't connect, they contradict, where their whole life is undermined, where every day and every moment they hear anything ever about sexuality. They either reject their sexual self or reject religion. What other choice do I have? And almost all the kids are 100% convinced that if we would tell them, if they would tell us, excuse me, where they're holding in life and what, what they're living like and what they feel like because they can't turn it off, we would reject them. The pillar of Hatznei Aleches collapses for sexual abuse victims. They can't hear the sugya. They can't hear the conversation. I either dissociate or act out. I live in a bubble, a world of my own, a private life that's disconnected from this yeshiva or chassidish world, the world we would like to bring our children up in. They know I'm a reject. They know when the teacher speaks and means well, forgive me, I really mean this, means well until they get trained in how to do this. And they mean well and give a drasha and they talk about all the Rebbeim who talk about Shmir Zaguf and Shmir Zainayim and, and the people who don't do this, that's Goyish. That's for Goyim. That's not us. What do you think the kids feel like inside? If we don't have that level of compassion, if we don't feel that level of compassion for the world, the crazy, hurtful, struggling world they live in. If we don't feel it in our hearts, we will never reach these kids. They will bounce off us. They will feel just ridiculed, humiliated, and assume we will reject them, which means they're already living with the rejection. By the process of projection, they project onto us, Lu Yitzu, you would know, you would reject me, so I'm already rejected. And the cause of this rejection is because the Torah says, Hatznei Aleches. And we're so busy trying to promote it, enforce it. When you fuss over a struggling child who may be a molestation victim, and you fight over a button at the top of her blouse, do you understand internally we're burying her. Do you understand that? Internally, her world collapses. This button? When you tell a boy who's been molested and has 
He was molested pre-puberty by older boys, and now he finds himself lacking when he hit puberty, lacking the strong negative feeling of attraction to males. All boys, they hit puberty, they discover Tivus Noshim. They also discover a disgust for Tivus Arnoshim. Hashem made it that way for us. And when a child gets molested pre-puberty, a boy, by older boys, that happens all the time, frequently they no longer develop the disgust for male sexuality. What a life this poor kid has. I've seen grown men fall into a suicidal depression, not knowing why, called every doctor, all the medicines, all the experts, to no avail. Suicidal depression. One time I was on a consult with a man in his 50s who'd been fine till then and fell into a depression and was suicidal and asked him one question the very first time. He absolutely fainted. He couldn't believe, why am I asking this question? I asked him, was he molested by boys pre-puberty? And he was shocked that I even asked the question. And then it came out that every shawl he goes to, sooner or later, he tries to sit in the front in a corner where he won't see anyone because he always sees someone that arouses desire in him. What a crushed, distra- finally he thought he had a place and right next to him they give a seat in the front after he's been there some years to someone he found he's attracted to. He wants to die. If we don't go to that place of compassion, if we're so busy trying to fix them and straighten them out as if they came up with some shita that they want to be like, you know, sexually active, some shita they don't want to dress up. Do you know, I talk to girls, it's an unbelievable thing. We frequently, my wife and I host you know, seminary students from America, the grandchildren and children of our friends. We do this all the time. We love doing it. And I observe to the girls, we talk, you know, they push us into conversations. We have very fascinating conversations at the Shabbos table. They've all read my book, so they come, you know, <laughs> ready to horror in the book. I ask them the question, you know, these are sort of mainstream kind of success stories. Does it ever occur to you not to dress Sanua? Almost all the girls like have no idea what that question even means. Like, why wouldn't I dress? What? Like, there's no question. Of course they dress Sanua. It's not even a half a minute. It's what we do. But a child that in some way has been sexualized, it's the exact opposite. One of their survival techniques is to experience themselves sexually. It's a way of denying anything bad happened. It's a way of saying, I was never molested, I was enjoying myself. I liked it. I enjoy being sexual. It's a denial, it's a deep, profound denial. If we don't recognize this stuff, we put our children into a massive second. It's no surprise they end up with drugs and feel suicidal ideation. Then there's the Amud of Limadah Torah. That's the second Amud our children's lives depend upon. It's not something we do. Learning Torah isn't something, even the girls today, the girls, I mean, whoever doesn't know Shmuel Base, you know, with all the rashes and the mabits, right? Limud Atayra is the most wonderful thing. It's, it's, Limud Atayra is what we do. It's not, you know, it's, excuse me, it's not what we do, it's who we are. We're B'nai Torah, with the children of the Torah, and learning Torah is who we are. It's not something you meant to just do. It's the essence of who we are. And certainly for a child, their journey through the system 
Limud Torah is the essence of their life, learning Torah. So what happens to all the children who have genuine learning disabilities and or what I refer to as de facto learning disabilities? What happens to them? What happens to their internal world? What is the world like for a child who comes to school every single day fully aware that they can never really do this properly? And despite however hard they try, they will never get the excited, happy look from their Rebbe or parents because they asked a brilliant question, because they memorized a lot of stuff. I always think about these bar mitzvahs, and believe me, I'm not, this is not a political statement. Can we just, just trying to draw out a, a concept? But what do all the other boys feel like when the one boy makes a siyam on Shisha Sidre Mishnah? How do all the others feel? Have we ever considered that? I can tell you that many of them go turn off completely because they watch the joy. They watch the joy from the Rebbeim and the Drashas about this few. I had Rebbe's who would, a kid asks Akasha and he makes the whole class stand up to listen because he asked Taisus Kasha. He's 11 years old. He asked Taisus, and it's a wonderful thing. Don't get me wrong. But can he ever look forward to anyone standing up for him in reference to Torah, ever? Do you know the brain? I don't have the pictures, but I, 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 ha I have them. What the brain of a learning disabled child looks like? It looks like a trauma victim. It looks like a rape victim. It looks like someone who was in a car crash and a, a member of the family died their brain looks the same after 12 years of being in school when you're learning disabled or you have de facto learning disabilities and you can't do it. And however much you try hard, you know you will never be a nachas. You can barely get grades. You work like a dog and you'll never get those good grades. What does that child feel like? Learning trauma is an insidious hurtful experience, where again, I repeat, it's not something we do, learning Torah, it's who we are. That's the nafkamina. And when a chilek of who you are is taken from you, when a chilek of who you are is undermined and you're told, you, you, you discover you can never do this well, and you'll never get that sparkle in the eye of your parents and your rebbeim and teachers. Never. You get the, okay, you know, you did good. You did good. You know, you did good. Ish. Maybe you try harder. A little bit, you know, harder next time. How do you tell a learning disabled or a, learning, a kid struggling with learning to try harder? What exactly are they meant to even do? that their brain can't comprehend or process properly. What happens with a child with a simple processing problem? Simple, little processing problem that has an anxiety attack every time when the teacher is teaching because do I remember or do I write it down? Do I listen or write? What do I do, listen or write? Because if I listen, I forget the first thing they said and I can't. And if I write it, I lose the second thing they said. Now what do I do? And then when I don't know anything, I look and sound and am treated like a bad person who didn't care. And I don't even know why. They're sweet kids. They're sweet little kids. And yet by fourth grade, many of these kids, their hearts already turned off. Click. By fourth grade. Because by fourth grade, they know they really can't do it. And by seventh grade, zikha, they're gone. When either of these amudim, limud ha or hatznea leches, collapse, either of these pillars collapse, then the child loses their sense of self and they feel rejected. They feel gone. See, what does everyone need to survive and thrive? What do we all need? What does all children 
We too, by the way, as adults, I guarantee you, we in this room need the same thing. But what do children desperately need to survive and thrive? They need a sense of connection. Connection, connection of community. They need to feel they belong. They need to feel connected, supported, loved, cared for, appreciated. So if we have a world where one in five, 20% of all children in the from world will have a childhood sexual abuse experience. One in five, 20%. The numbers are staggering. The amount of kids who have either a true learning disability or a de facto, de facto means the SARS, they got SARS. There's maybe financial SARS, medical, emotional SARS in the home. Who knows? SARS. There's, a, there's unlimited lists of SARS that go on in people's lives that impact the children and prevent them from being able to learn. They can't concentrate. They can't. I had a kid one time who was ready. They were ready to throw him out of school because he went to school and he ran home. He went to school and he ran home. And they tried everything to stop him running home. So I sat down with this kid and tried to hear his story. I discovered why he ran home every day. He wasn't rebellious. Not only wasn't he a bad kid, he was a tzaddik yisoy daylam. His father had recently left Koil and went to work. His poor mother was overwhelmed, couldn't function, had had postpartum depression. They kept it quiet, and this kid if I remember, he was nine, went home every day to clean the house to make the house easier for his mother to manage. And they were ready to throw him out. So was he learning? He couldn't learn. He couldn't concentrate on learning when his poor mother was home and needed help and they couldn't afford it. He went home and helped her. There's a million reasons why kids don't learn, but when this is taken from a child in our world, learning or tznias, hatznei alechas, when these things are taken from a child, their world collapses. Now the problem is this. Unbeknown, if we don't go and work through these sugyas, if we don't really harav in these sugyas, that means we study it and understand it and we kind of it, we really believe the, the, this truth. We abandon the old, you know, the regular chinuch stuff. Just let him know he shouldn't do it, you know, that stuff. Just tell him. We abandon that and we tune into who they really are. And we see their behavior, the dysfunctional behavior, and we tune into it to understand what is it telling us? What does it mean? We have to tune in because if we don't, they carry pain and hurt, internal pain and hurt that is so unbearable. When I say unbearable, they get to a point where I'd like to die, where I don't care if I do. And only drugs will stop them, although drugs can be deadly too. But they self-medicate. Why wouldn't they? Or they become sexually active as a way of denying that anything bad happened to me. And they certainly abandon being from because everything about being from informs them you're a loser. You're a bad person. You're really bad. So why would they stay connected to us? This is the sugya, that if we don't have compassion for these poor struggling children, it's a horrible Yetzirah to just fix everything with Svei Petch and just accuse these kids of having a Yitzhahara, and that's why you're acting out the way you do, without considering the life they really have, the pain they carry. I can tell you my experience with struggling kids, they are the sweetest, nicest. They're so genuine and real inside. There's something so precious and human and vulnerable about them. Once they feel safe, what comes out of them is astonishing. Svei Petch? I said, yes, that's the Yed Zahara. It's coming right out of you, I told him. Afterwards, I apologized. <laughs> I did. 
But you should know something. He said, you're right. You were right. And I said, I know, but I may have embarrassed you. I may have embarrassed you. When we don't know this, what I'm explaining to you now, when we don't know this, we don't literally live in this. We don't really believe this. If there's the slightest part of you that doesn't, your children will feel rejection. The kids, as it is, go through four alienations, four, that destroy their lives. The first one, of course, is school, because the school hubs what's going on, and they see they're not with the program, and before you know it, they get the evil eye or they're out. The next alienation is their friends. I, I, I'm going to say just the lotion that people use. I don't, I can't, I, you know, I can't even say it. <sighs> yeah, let me check. I'll tell you what I was going to say, and then we can strike it, all of us. And let's all make a commitment tonight never to say this again, okay? Is that all right? I'm going to say it. Only so that we can all just be... And my stomach is in knots with the thought of saying this. But if we, I'll say it just... I'll be mucker of myself just so we can get rid of it and never say it again. After your kid gets thrown out of school, they lose their good friends. Their good friends distance from them too. See, I hate this word, good friends. Let's call it their former friends. Can we just say their former friends? And let's not judge why or what or whatever, but I don't like the idea of, of calling one person good and one person, by implication, bad. In God's eyes, we're all good. We were taken out of Mitzrayim at Mem Tesh Shari Tuma. I guarantee you this, no kid in seventh grade who's struggling with these issues is worse than Mem Tesh Shari Tuma. They're a lot better than that. And the Kodesh Baruch who brought us out of Mem Tesh Tuma to tell us, I will never love you because of your maisim. I'll love you because of your metzias, because of who you are. So the former friends disappear. That's the second alienation. Then the community starts alienating because their clothing changes, their hairstyle changes. You know, you see clearly signs on them of the struggle, it all changes. And then people look at them in stores and stare at them in the street. Sometimes people even say to them, you can dress like that in public. What are you dressing like that? Chutzpah. In our community, go dress like that somewhere else. So the community, they feel alienated. And God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, the final worst level of alienation is where they feel they're losing their parents. God forbid. God forbid. Because that's when they're in a Sophie Kuch Nefesh. That's the Sophie Kuch Nefesh. Kids who've been... You cannot treat trauma with Svei Pech. You have to first accept what we're looking at is looking in the eyes of trauma. When you see your struggling child, you're looking at the face of trauma. So you're not, you're not a trauma expert. Okay, no one says you have to be. But just trust me on this. When you look at your child and their struggles, you're looking in the face of trauma, even if you don't know what it is. And if you go and ask your kid and they say, no, I was never traumatized. Well, you think that's true? Why would they tell you? They don't trust you yet. Maybe they even forgot. Maybe they don't even know. How many of the learning trauma children I've met had no clue? Wow, that's interesting. Okay. Okay, this is like Nevada, Kshalashudas. Okay, now, now I'll say Rosin de Rosin. I'll get away with everything. I'm just going to keep going here. Okay, is that okay? Great. I actually had the schus when I first came to Israel to learn in Nevadok, Beis Yosef Nevadok in Yushalayim. And Rabbi Tzim Brook, Zeich Hazal Livrocha, was Rosh Hashiva. And we heard him uh, by Shalashudas after Mincha in the dark. And it all got dark. You heard this voice. It made a Roshim on us. I can't tell you. Maybe it's better with the lights on. I don't know. So they go through multiple, multiple rejections. And God forbid the final rejection is where parents lose hope and lose faith. You cannot fix 
trauma with conventional chinuch. Conventional chinuch is perfect, but not for trauma. For those children that need regular chinuch, it works. Nothing wrong with it. When you have a struggling child, you have to open a different box. And every time you want to do regular chinuch, stick it in the other box and seal it. Tape it up. Duct tape it. Put it on a shelf. It doesn't belong to this sugya. In this sugya, it's a mazik. Almost always, we as parents, I include myself and my wife, as we went on this journey, our first struggling child, she was 14 when she went off. It totally took us by surprise. We had no inkling. I promise you it's the truth. Am I right or wrong? Zero inkling. The day they called us and told us she was caught in a pizza store with a boy, right? And she was, of course, thrown out of school for that. It was such a shock. We were like, what do you mean? Nothing. We saw nothing. We as parents, until we learn the sugyas, we see nothing. And worse still, we treat whatever we see as regular, like, you know, they're just being defiant. They're just being chutzpahdik whatever it is, and we do everything wrong. See, by the time most of us wake up to recognize and embrace my child is struggling, we're years behind the struggle. Whatever we discover, they're already way ahead doing worse. It takes us years to catch up with this. So here's the question. The question is, what are we meant to do if we have no control, zero, over things happening to our children? What are we meant to do to protect them? I've never yet met a parent who, after finding out their child was molested, knew in advance it was going to happen, and just chose not to, you know, not to pay attention. I never met one of them, ever. I met parents who were mortified and devastated when they discovered it happened and they had no clue it was happening or was going to happen. They just had no clue. How do we prepare our kids to know whether learning trauma is occurring to them? How do we do that? How do we know? We push our kids in the younger grades to learn and learn and learn. How are you meant to know which one's which? And you can't. The answer is you can't. How do you know if they're carrying Tsaurus in their head because you have an elderly Alzheimer's grandmother who your parents and your little kid are busy being metapple with this Alzheimer's grandmother and the whole time you feel abandoned but you don't know what you're feeling? You didn't know. And you see your parents in Sadiqim taking care of your grandmother, which you know is a good thing. So you put your needs on hold. You bury your own needs, only to discover later on that you needed tremendous, tremendous help, idud, support, and you never got it. And by the time you're 12, 13, you're half off the derech. None of us know these things in advance. So what are we meant to do? We're not going to change the system. Our kids are going to go through it in this world. And many of them are going to face trauma that will take them away from us and away from our world. And you can't stop it. As Rashi says in Nida, Tesayin Noma Beis, HaKol Bidei Shemayim, Chutz Miyir Shemayim. And Rashi says, HaKol Bidei Shemayim, all a person's midas characteristics, you know, ADD, ODD, OCD, their characteristics, their midas, their personalities, the karosov, and the events that transpire outside your home that happen to them or inside your home that you don't know about. Karosov. Is boyin lo begzeres melech? You can't stop it. 
So how do we, what are we meant to do if we know these things happen? They're almost always out of our control. When I first wrote in the Jewish Observer in 98, they dared to have a statement that the overwhelming consensus of orthodox mental health professionals, interesting, no one asked me, and I was working in this. No one asked my opinion. I know who they were, this consensus, was that children going off the derch were coming from dysfunctional homes. It was so interesting. Number one, I knew it wasn't true because I asked my wife if we're dysfunctional. <laughs> and she said, I don't think so. Maybe you are, but... <laughs> We were not dysfunctional. We actually had this incredibly loving home. A little plug for the book, you know? Okay. We had a loving home. We still have a loving home. And yet they suffered because things happened. We None of us knew it then. I wrote to them. I fought with them. I told them it was wrong. Together with a colleague, I wrote a stark mechor. And that was when, back in 98, they had the famous edition on Kids on the Fringe that sold out twice. It was a game changer in the from world where we began the journey of stop blaming parents. When you blame parents, I'll tell you exactly what happens at home. When your 14-year-old comes down, shall we say, not dressed in the optimum way you would have liked. Can we leave it at that? Okay, great. And if... The rhetoric on the streets, it's like signs and posters everywhere, is that we all agree that kids off the derrick are coming from dysfunctional homes. How easy is it to let her walk out your front door? How easy is that? To let your son with no yarmulke and an earring, you know, and a tank top and some, a few like, you know, neat drawings on his arm, how do you let him walk out the house if he's a walking advertisement that you're dysfunctional? Now, the truth is you might be dysfunctional, but that's not the point. That war that happens at the front door when you try to stop them walking out can destroy children's lives literally. The, the feeling of rejection and anger. I've had fathers fighting on the floor with their kid, wrestling them to try and stop them getting out of the house because out there, it must, they're walking advertisement that I'm dysfunctional. It's not true. Things happen. They're beyond our control. None of us knew about it till afterwards. And afterwards, uninformed, we did everything wrong. Sorry. We did it too. It took us here. We were alone. You know, when we started doing this, I had never heard of Shimon Russell. <laughs> never heard of him. Never saw one of his videos. Nothing. I heard of a Shimon Russell who was so embarrassed and ashamed he wanted to become a lawyer and change fields. I felt like just suing everybody. But I certainly felt humiliated and embarrassed to be a therapist because officially we're all dysfunctional, right? We've come a long way since then. In the last 25 years, we've come a long, long way. So what is it we're meant to do? So, I just want to say this very clearly. The same model that I introduced here at Kola Neshamas, Kola Neshamot, sorry, did I say it right? Colin Nishamot. Is that with a T on the end, is it? It is, right? Yeah, go to T. Colin Nishamot. Okay. When I introduced, you see what it's written on the bottom, safe, secure, seen, and soothed? When I found these words in Dan Siegel's book years and years ago, the first time I just went past it, it was just reading the book. And then something my brain caught it, and I went back. And I found a model that was so amazing, and I want to make this very clear. People get upset. Uh, it's been said to me, it happened to me in Chicago last week. I spoke about prevention, and uh, I was jet-lagged, right? There was that moment. We, got, we arrived in America that morning. I was jet-lagged, and I forgot to say the end of the drosha. I left everyone, like, miserable. It was, like, crazy. So I apologize. I made up for it Sunday morning, and I told them all, come Sunday morning, I'll be marshaling. I will not make that mistake tonight. Safe, secure, seen, and soothed is an incredibly profound model 
listen carefully, for both prevention and repair. This is the beauty of it. When I was in Chicago, I forgot to do the repair piece. So I talked about prevention, and everyone went home and said, fine, you just killed us. So we all, none of us did this, now what? <laughs> People went home depressed, it was like crazy. Someone wrote me an email about it. Safe, secure, seen, and soothed is both a model of prevention. That means it creates resilience. That is the word. That's what we all need. Our chayv kadosh. Our chayv kadosh. Because kol midayis of a kareis of his boy and melech. And you can never know what's going to happen to your kids. You can't know. As good as you try. What we need to do is is help our kids by creating resilience. And we create resilience. I'm not taking questions now. Is that okay? Uh, you know, if I'm up to it, I'll take afterwards. We'll see. If we create resilience, we give them their best shot at it, obviously. And halavai, we would all know this information. At least let's pass it on to our kids when they get married. And they should know this information. As a matter of fact, when we wrote the book, the idea was we should all give it to our married children as soon as they get married. Give them two copies. Let them do it right. Let them work out what we didn't know. But it's not just a model of creating resilience, but it's a focus for helping, although not guaranteeing, but helping create repair. That's the profundity of this system. It's the system that has to form the backbone of our approach to chinuch, to our children, to true chinuch, in this day and age. Because the challenges they face, ruba de ruba, are so great that the least we can do is endow them with resilience. Safety. We have to make sure they're safe on five dimensions, physical safety, emotional, psychological, sexual, and spiritual. We have to make sure they're safe. Never shame a child, ever, for their lack of spirituality or connection to Yadis. Be patient and wait. We have to make kids feel safe. Our fa you know what the biggest thing with safety is? It's your facial expression, body language, and tone of voice. Your face, I'm telling you straight, if you're not smiling, don't talk to your kid. Go to bed. Go to the bathroom. Go for a walk. Do anything other than talk to your child. Because today's children interpret a sad, angry, frustrated, tired, exhausted face as disapproval. Obviously not one time. If you're walking around like the Cheshire cat every day and then one day you look miserable, it's not going to hurt anyone. I'm talking about as your way of life. We have to be exceedingly careful. Do you know how many people I see who are on the edge of exhaustion all the time? Life is hard. And they don't realize, I respectfully <clears throat> you know, inquire Sometimes my clients, do you mind if I tell you what you look like? I'm not trying to be offensive. But you look angry. I say, I look angry? I say, yes, you do. Usually they say, well, now I'm angry. <laughs> but in all honesty, I tell the men, you know, ladies have like a compact, right? You have that thing with the mirror business, right? Men, you know, you fill a mirror, mirror, keep one in your pocket, get a spare one. And when you come home, take a quick look. If you're not smiling, go for a walk. Go to Myriv. Go to Myriv twice. <laughs> but don't go home. Body language, facial expression, tone of voice, these are the vehicles through which we communicate our pleasure or displeasure to our children. It's a drush of a sechelein. But it's crucial that we own, how is my child, that safety. Can I create safety in the life of my children? 
where they'll feel safe to be close to me. Because I'll tell you this, when you created safety, or again in the reparative afterwards, as you create safety again, then your child can unburden to you. If you create safety with your child, your child knows I can come and tell you what I'm doing or what's happened to me. They feel safe with you. They're more likely to be able to share their struggles and hurts and pains because you created safety. And I tell you, as crazy as it sounds, you ask the average kid, do you feel safe to tell all your secrets to your parents? And the average kid says, no. That's sad. That's really sad. So both in creating resilience and repairing the damage, safety first. Create safety, otherwise there's no connection. We're never going to help them. Secure. Secure, we could speak. By the way, these things are in the book. If you have it, read it. And, and even in the book, I said it, ten l'chachem, misachamoid, details. Just to give musogim. Each one could be a book. You understand? Each of these could be a book. But security, we have to create a place where our children feel secure. For example, the Shabbos table and the Yontif table. If you have a kid in kindergarten, gun, do their Pasha sheet. Because they love God. Shem is here, Shem is there. You know, they love God. And they're looking forward. You can't stop them talking. Whatever questions, they'll tell you everything they knew about everything. And they just go on and on. It's like delightful. So the littlest one, we used to do this system, very simple. We did the youngest, and then we'd open it up, going up in the ages of the kids. Would you, anyone who wants to add, put your hand up, you can add. So anyone who actually knew which Pasha it was that week, <laughs> anyone who actually knew we're talking about the Pasha, anyone who wasn't asleep, or in another room, they're welcome. Say something on the parasha. No problem. Feel good about yourself. But no chiyah. Security. I'm giving you, there's a hundred mashalim for security. But also the security we have to work on our relationships, how we talk on the phone, how we act, how we act, interact with each other, that we create a secure environment for our children. These are the building blocks of resilience. Because a child in a secure home has the confidence, he doesn't know it yet, but they report it later, have the unconscious confidence that I'm going to get through this. When they live in a secure environment, somehow they know, my parents are going to hang on to me, they love me. It may be a long journey, a very long journey, a very, very long journey. But they have the security to know we're going to go this together. My parents are with me. It's crucial. Seen is one of the most sad stories in our world. Seen. We have a bunch of kids, and we call them the kids. I have kids who tell me, don't you ever say that word. I hate it when you say that. The kids. You know, it's like, let's, here's the kids. Let's get the kids to bed. Let's get the kids in the car. Let's get the kids in the bath. There's a thing called the kids. There's a glob. They're called the kids. Let's do the kids, right? Kids. You wait till the youngest is 20, the oldest is 40. And they're completely different. No sheikhs to each other. They're kids. They're not kids. They're individuals. We have to see our children. That vav. We have to mine that vav. Pull it out of our children. We have to see who they are. That's actually chinuch, by the way. That's what chinuch is. Chinuch is pulling out. It's about extraction. It's about pulling out of our children their uniqueness and then showing it to them how they can use it productively. That's chinuch. A malamed is about installation. He puts yediya, you know, an aleph and a comets aleph, ah, oh, he puts the yediya in the head of the child. That's installation. That's not chinuch. Chanoich lena can only be al pidakai, because the whole point of chinuch is to pull out his potential, who he is, what makes him special, and show it to him in a way that's helpful and productive to him and her, so they can know what their future is, what their job is, what their life is about. That's chinuch. 
That's really what chinuch is. We have to see our children for who they are. We have to show them their strengths and gently and respectfully show them their weaknesses they need to work on in an encouraging and positive way. But we have to see their uniqueness. And the last one is soothed when they have their struggles and challenges and problems in life. We have to reach inside. And the first thing we do is not how, I tell you, when we grew up, if you got hit by a Rebbe, you dare not tell your father when you come home. You got what? Today, whatever they do, it doesn't matter, especially when it looks so obvious they brought it upon themselves. Like, who told you to take the training wheels off? Now I've got to go to the hospital and you broke your finger. I mean, come on. No. First you soothe them, put them on your lap, and give them, like, cuddles and warmth and love. Two days later, you want to give them a musadrash, or wait two days. Give it to them two days later. The, the tchum of children change. Do we understand that? The nature of children, that's another drasha. I'm sorry, it's not for now. But the nature of children in the world change. Children are not the resilient children they once were. And they're living, growing up in an exceedingly highly competitive environment where you have to produce and be a Mitsuyan or you're worthless. That's the message they get. Sad as sad is, but that's the message. In this world of children who grow up in a world where the outside world is talking about entitlement, I was thinking actually even about these Afghanas here, about the, the judicial reform, right? right? Forget about the issue. But the fact, what do you think young people are seeing in this country today? They're seeing that if you don't like the government, you can just go out and do Afghanas and change it. And it was the structure of society, we grew up, you vote for the government, so let them battle it out, you know, the two sides, let them fight and argue and scream, that's what we elected them for. And then they paskin, one way or another, and we were Kabul, you don't like it, vote them out in the next election. But there's structure, there's covered, there's respect for authority, do you understand what I'm saying? If forget the judicial reform, that's not the issue. But the fact that we don't have to respect authority anymore, it's gone. Just do Afghans. What do you think the young people are seeing when they see these things happen? Trust me. They lose sense of authority. It's what says in Pirke Alves, right? Without, uh, without the, uh, what does the Mishnah say? Yeah, Moshe Machas. Without that, we boil them, we eat each other up, right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, the ladies know it. They know Mishnah. Is. They're better. <laughs> Let, let, me, let me see if I can finish. I, do you mind if I don't take questions? Yeah, I can't. I'm so sorry. I, I, if we, once we do that, we're done. Okay, that's like going on Afghana against the government. You know, it's like... From that to, obviously, the choices in the outside world that children are making when they're not so free in who they are, so I can be someone else, change my gender, I can change my life, I can do whatever I want. This world, believe me, is hitting our children. This world is affecting our world. Anyone who doesn't think that is naive. It is fast. I, the, the shailas I get from Rabbonim today are unthinkable compared to even 10 years ago. They're shailas that could, were never even thought of 10 years ago. So in such an environment where we have a competitive life and one in five are being molested, and I don't know the numbers of the learning... The learning trauma is so high, I don't know the number, but believe me, it's way off. It's, oh, it's too many. Yeah, I contain myself. My wife's happy. I contain myself. It's too many. Let's just say that. In such a world, we have to create resilience. Safe, secure, seen, and soothed. That's why they took it. It's the most profound model to work on that all families must be working on in your home, constantly harving on safe, secure, and seen and soothed. And the beauty of the model is that if you've already got those struggling kids, safe, secure, seen, and soothed is the model of repair too. That's the beauty of it. It's such a beautiful model. It takes us to repair because a child, the Hanukha we had was when they go through their struggles and issues, they disconnect from us because they assume that we reject them. 
because we've been teaching values of Torah, the values of Sneas, on and on and on, and they failed in those areas. They feel rejected. They project onto us that rejection. Whether we even say it or not, it's projected. Comes along, us. I do this with all my clients. We identify safe, secure, senior. Which one are we going to work on this week? Which one do you think your kid's missing the most? And we start working on it. We start conjuring up ideas to create safety or security or seen or soothe. We work on it. And through that model, we begin to see the process of repair. The only difference is going off happens in three months. Coming back can take 30 years. You understand? It's a lifetime. It's a job. It's a process. But they need us. I can tell you this, as parents, authentically, the journey my wife and I have been through, we would never change it. We would never rerun our lives and wish we'd had the, uh, you know, the cookie cutter, the regular, never, never, because of the challenges it brought us and forced us to work on. Safe, secure, seen, and soothed is the model of building resilience and it's the model that helps us with repairing the imbalance and the connection. And it's the connection with our children that best insulates them from wanting to die. Doesn't guarantee, by the way, nothing I'm said guarantees anything. But I'm simply observing that the best way we can prevent them continuing on a d terrible journey through life, a frightening, sophic, nefesh journey, is reconnecting with them. And safe, secure, and seems is something we have to think about. You literally think about it. You, you go through each one and ask, I wonder which one's missing with my child. Let's work together. Let's work on strengthening this one. This week, next week, the week after, check, look at them, evaluate them, understand them, and then work on them. Oh. It's late, I'm sorry. Let me, we printed out some cards. I, I felt it was important. And I printed up, I wrote something up, which when you leave tonight, there are cards at the back. Please pick one up and take it with you. The title of the card is the word attunement. Attunement. By the way, it's not in the dictionary. It's very interesting. It's not like, the, you know, the old dictionaries, attunement isn't there. It's like a new word. It's funny. Spell checkers don't have it. It's fascinating. Attunement. Attunement. What is attunement? So I want to just read you what I met, wrote. And it is, it's on the cards in the back. I want to explain it. Attunement is the key. Attunement is the key if we're going to save our children's lives. Attunement is where I... I get out of my own daladamas, my own brain, and I try to tune in to what is it that my child is feeling. Who are they? What are they feeling? Attunement is the emotional and psychological process of being in sync with your child. What our children lack the most I said at the beginning that takes them to this sophic guch nefesh is the disconnect. Attunement is the opposite. Attunement is where I emotionally and psychologically I tune in to what they're feeling. They, I show my child I'm in sync with you. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean I agree with anything, but it means I understand you and I hear you. I feel you. It involves understanding, recognizing, and responding to the emotions and needs of the other person. With attunement, I can tune in, I can respond to their needs. I can understand what they need. By doing so, it cuts through, attunement captures all four S's in one go. Safe, secure, seen, and soothe. When you do attunement, you're doing all four S's in one go. You've gone for the gold. Because it shows your child, I hear you. I feel you. And they, they see and experience, I'm with you. I feel you. 
Attunement helps build strong connections between us. Without it, your kids live around you. They distance from you. Without proper attunement, so your kids live in a world around you, but they don't live with you. They don't feel heard, felt. So we can't tune in properly, then the kids disconnect. And it requires for us to get out of ourselves. It requires for us to be brave enough to have the courage, the willingness to tune in to who they are and let go of who I wish they were. This is the hardest job. This is the key. My wife and I had to do that. We had to come to a place where we gave up who we wish they were. Every one of us, anyone who doesn't see this is in deep denial. You need a lot of help, trust me. Because we all have deep down this longing for who we wish they were that will get in the way. Attunement shows our children, I've let go of that. This is not about me. Because all the child's life that drives them away from us and Yadus is because they think we're doing it for us. The message they picked up is, I'm embarrassed. I'm hurting. And the worst, worst language of this could ever be is, so why did I even have you? And kids say this to their parents, what did you have me for? What, you wanted slaves to clean the house before Shabbos? The children, unfortunately, experience life, these struggling kids, that, you know, their life has to make us happy. And once we see this struggle with a child, we have to go the other way. We have to show them, I'm here to make you happy. You're my child. You're my child. Where is the most important sugya in the entire life of every Jewish family? What's the word? Harut? Harut? Is that the right word? Harut? Parenting. Who is parenting in the Torah? Isn't it bizarre that you got a whole shulchanach and you got the one most important sugya of the whole Torah is not there? Parenting. Strange, no? This is a brisker raid. I said, I got a, I've got a teretz klali and the Teretz Prati. I'll tell you the Teretz Klali. Teretz Klali is Azai. Teretz Klali is that you can't have a section on parenting because the whole Torah is meant to teach us how to be Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem, how to be the children of the Avarachamon. The whole Torah is meant to take us to be his children. And then our children are meant to witness us, and that's how they get it. So that's the Teretz Klali. You can't have a, a prat on parenting, because the whole Torah is parenting. I'll give you a better Teretz, Prati. I said, the Chinuch says that the time for Kibbut of the aim is a Korosotai. Let me tell you what the Chinuch is telling you. This is the Sugi of parenting. The fifth of the Aser Sadibras is the Sugi of parenting in the Torah. Right there, in that mitzvah, is the sugi of parenting. What the chinuch is telling you is some brilliant insight. Is you're meant to parent your children in a za oifen that they'll naturally be makatov to you. That's parenting. You're meant to connect so deeply and meaningfully with your children as you guide them through life, as you lay down the structure and the rules and the as you do the whole sugi of life. You're meant to do it in a way where they will naturally be makatov. You're not meant to take a hammer later on and pound them on the head. You better be makatov. What's wrong with you? Be makatov. That's not what the chinuch is saying. The chinuch is saying you're meant to tune in while you do the structure, the rules, the discipline, whatever you're doing. You're meant to tune in to do it in a za'ifen that when they matriculate, they grow up, they have tremendous akos to you. That's the sugya of attunement. This is our sugya. 
We take the four S's, both as, as to create resilience, to help them afterwards, and we focus it all through the funnel of attunement, where we tune into them so they can hear us. And doing this, or labor to help them, we both prevent and then we help them afterwards when things happen that we couldn't stop, that we couldn't stop, that wasn't our fault, promise you it wasn't our fault. I have many midrashim and zayas that say it. It comes to us. It's our gift. And if we use attunement properly, please pick up a card on the way out and steig in attunement with your children. As a labor to help them, we will all together be doing very godly work. Thank you very much.